today on Aqua Kids. Travel with the Aqua Kids to the Tennessee Aquarium's Animal Care Facility, where they are breeding and raising Lake Sturgeon and Southern Appalachian Brook Trout. Plus, go on a snorkeling adventure to get an up-close look at the fish of the Conestoga River. Aqua Kids, Aqua Kids, doing what we have to do, saving our earth, land, air, and sea. All we gotta do is keep it green and blue. Since we're here with the Tennessee Aquarium, I thought today would be a great opportunity for the Aqua Kids to meet one of my colleagues, Anna, to talk about a wonderful reintroduction project of brook trout and lake sturgeon. So let's get the kids started. Guys, we've got fish here that we're raising that need feeding. I thought maybe you'd like to get in on the opportunity. Oh, is that why we're here at the animal care facility? It is, and I also want to introduce you to a colleague of mine. We're working on a great project that involves restoration and reintroduction of a couple of species. So I'm going to send you over, and she'll tell you more about it. Okay. Hey, Aqua Kids. How are you guys doing? Hey. Hey. So Hannah tells us that you've got this really cool project going on. Could you tell us a little bit about it? Absolutely. This is a project we're really excited by here at the Tennessee Aquarium. These are baby lake sturgeon, part of a species that we've been returning to the Tennessee River for the past 15 years. So every year we go up to Wisconsin, we get eggs from the lake sturgeon populations in Wisconsin that are fairly strong. And then we bring them back to the southeast and we along with several other partner hatcheries raise them in captivity for three to six months before we release them back into the wild. How many do you raise here? Well right now we've got about 1,500 fish um, and it varies every year depending on how things go but this has been a great year for us. So since the beginning of this project, how many have you released to the wild? Well, we along with three other partner hatcheries have restored about 180,000 lake sturgeon back into the Tennessee River over the past 15 years. 180,000? Whoa! Yeah, we're actually pretty proud of that. It's been a really long-term effort and it shows you what conservation is all about. A group of people coming together, doing what they can to restore an animal back to the wild. And that takes time and it takes effort, but it's really worth it in the long run. So have you seen an improvement in the population of the sturgeon? We have. It's really exciting. Over the past couple of years, we're getting to the point where every time we go out to monitor how our lake sturgeon are doing, we're actually catching them quite regularly. And that's incredibly exciting for us. We're getting fish from all the different ages that we've released. They're moving all the way up from Knoxville, 180 miles downstream to here in Chattanooga. And we've started a new monitoring program where we actually put tags into fish that constantly emit a noise. They're called sonic tags. And whenever they swim past a receiver, the receiver logs which fish that was and what time it was. So we're really excited that we're not only returning these sturgeon, but we're seeing them in the river and they're flourishing again. Is there anything special you guys do here to prepare them for the wild? We do actually. One of the main things we do here is make sure we're feeding them foods that would be found in the wild. So they never get used to any sort of pellet feed that sometimes you see in hatchery use. We use bloodworms and krill and you'll get a chance to experience that later. This has been one of our really successful long-term conservation projects, but let's head to the back so I can show you something newer that we're working on. Right back to your left. Whoa, what's in this tank here? This is one of our really exciting new conservation projects. These are Southern Appalachian brook trout. This is a trout that's the only trout that's native to the southeastern United States. They used to be found all across this uh, Appalachian region that we have here, but now they're in, only in 13% of their native range here in Tennessee and North Carolina. Why is that? Well, there's been a combination of factors that have been a really big problem for these brook trout. First of all, we introduced popular sport fish like rainbow and brown trout for fishing, and they get bigger here in the southeast and really can outcompete and even eat our native brook trout. A growing factor that we're concerned about is climate change because brook trout are now found in very high elevation streams here in the southeast and there's really no water left for them to migrate up to if things get hotter. So if climate change is increasing and water's getting warmer, then what does that mean for these guys? Well, it's not great news for these brook trout because they live in really cold water. One of the problems we have here is that they're at 52 degrees right now, which is why these tanks get so condensed and you can't quite see through them. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard if you're a fish that needs cold water to survive in a warming world. So do the brown trout and rainbow trout live in warmer waters then? They do tend to live in warmer waters and we'll find them more in the reservoirs. But like any trout, 
all of them need really cool, really clear water to survive and thrive. So there are other trout in the water. Why does it matter that we protect these guys? Well, to me, fish are kind of like a box of crayons. Would you rather be coloring with an 8-pack or a 128-pack? I think it's really important that we have all the fish protected that we have here in the southeast. And that's a really hard thing to do. We have a lot of native fish here in the southeast. We're going to see more of them during your visit. So to me, this diversity is really important, and it's just a cascading impact. When we lose one species, it's a lot easier to lose more. Wow, there are two great stories here about the lake sturgeon and the brook trout. Yeah, but I wonder what we can do to help them. Great question, Drew. A couple of easy things that you can do, and remember, reusable water bottles and get the water right out of your own homes from the tap, and help other people understand there are tons of species in the rivers and lakes right in their own backyard. It's not just the rainforest and the ocean. Aqua Kids will be right back. Now it's time for Aqua Quiz with your host, Drew Cruz. Hey everybody, I'm your host, Drew Cruz, and it's now time for you, the viewer, to test your knowledge with Aqua Quiz. Let's get started. Lake sturgeon are also known as living fossils because they've survived virtually unchanged for over 150 million years. They can live up to 100 years of age and weigh hundreds of pounds. So what is the record weight of a lake sturgeon? Is it A, 150 pounds, B, 175 pounds, C, 200 pounds, or D, 240 pounds? We'll have the answer right after the break. So have you come up with the answer? What is the record weight of a lake sturgeon? The answer is D, 240 pounds. In 2012, a lake sturgeon weighing 240 pounds was recorded in Minnesota. Insert funny Drew joke here. Wait, no joke? No. Well, we'll see you next time with, with another Aqua Kit quiz. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. And we're back to cooking with the Aqua Kids. Today our main course will be krill. With a side of bloodworms. Mm. Very funny, guys. Come with me and I'll show you how to beat the sturgeon. <laughs> All right, guys. So today we're going to feed the lake sturgeon. Um, these are our biggest fish. So we're going to feed them krill. Krill is like a really small shrimp. Um, these are our biggest fish, so they like to have the biggest food. So if you want to go ahead and take that bucket, right. and if you stick your hand in, it's kind of like feeding ducks in the park. Go ahead and toss some food around and spread it out evenly throughout the tank. Uh. <laughs> oh yeah. Sturgeon are benthic feeders, which means that they feed off the bottom of the tank. Ah. So they won't actually swim up to get their food. So once it settles to the bottom, they will start feeding. Is this what they would normally eat in the wild? In the wild, they would pretty much eat anything that they can stick in their mouths. They have little barbels on the bottom of their snouts. So they can sense food in the water. So they'll eat snails, they'll eat um, little worms, they'll eat um, small macroinvertebrates. So how old are these sturgeon? These sturgeon are about three months old. Um, and these are our biggest fish genetically. They, these are the ones that grew faster than some of the other ones. How old can they get? 150 years old, which is the longest living fish in North America. Wow. So sturgeon are like swimming dinosaurs, right? Don't they date back a long time? Yeah, they look like dinosaurs, don't they? Yeah. They've been swimming around for millions of years. All right, guys, it looks like we're about done here. Let's head over and feed the brook trout. All right. All right, guys, so now we're going to move on to feeding our brook trout broodstock. Yes. Broodstock? What's broodstock? It was a festival back in the 60s. I'm pretty sure that was woodstock. Oh. No, broodstock are actually the parents of the juvenile fish that we raise here. So are these caught from the wild? Yes, so we um, went and caught these guys up in the Great Smoky Mountain National Park. There's three different streams of fish in here. So in the fall, we will actually spawn these fish to make little babies. Um, and then we will raise them, and then the babies will go back up into the streams where their parents came from. And they're threatened? Yes, yeah, so the Southern Appalachian brook trout are a um, imperiled species. So a lot of it has to do with climate change, as well as invasive species. These guys look pretty hungry. I think it's feeding time. I know I am. <laughs> yeah, so we can go ahead and toss it in, just like the lake surgeon. So just take a few handfuls and toss it in. These guys are pelagic feeders, which means that they swim in the water column, so they'll come up right up and get it. Cool. Here, fishy, fishy, fishy. So is this what they'll be eating in the wild? In the wild, they'll eat more um, macroinvertebrates, which are just large aquatic bugs. 
Um, and when they get bigger, they might actually eat smaller fish. Polar bears are the largest land carnivore on Earth and live almost exclusively on sea ice that forms along the Arctic coast in places such as Alaska, Canada, and Russia. With a heavy pelt, thick layer of blubber, and fur on the bottom of their feet, these aggressive predators are designed for the cold. Polar bear prey on a variety of different animals, including beluga whale and walrus. However, seal is their primary food source. Remains left from a polar bear meal sustain a host of Arctic scavengers. There are only about 25,000 polar bears left in the wild. Global warming has stunted the development of sea ice, making it nearly impossible for this animal to hunt and thrive. Sadly, at their current rate of decline, these fantastic creatures could be extinct within three decades. Find out ways you can help the polar bear and other apex predators on our website. Hi, Hannah here. For more information on today's show, go to aquakids.tv. Aquakids will be right back. Want to keep up with our adventures? Follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. We venture to the Conasauga River here in the Cherokee National Forest so the Aqua Kids get a hands on experience seeing the variety of fish here in the river. Hey! Hey! hey. You guys ready for a river adventure? Yeah! yeah. Alright, we're gonna check out the biodiversity here. So, you guys are gonna need wetsuits because the water is about 72 degrees. Get suited up and we'll get going. All right. Can't wait to see what species we find today. We're gonna see over 76 different species awesome. here today. Hey. hey! 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 Sarah, our field biologist, the Aqua Kids. Nice Hi. to meet you. Nice to meet you. We're gonna go out, we're gonna see some fish, and then Sarah is gonna tell us why we found, what we found, where we found it. But before that, I'm gonna introduce you to Jim, and he's gonna tell us about this area and um, this project that he's working on. So let's get started with Jim, and then we'll go swim. Hey, Jim. Hi, welcome to the Cherokee National Forest. I'm Jim Herrig, I'm the aquatic biologist here. And we're about to take you into the beautiful Conasauga River where we're gonna see a lot of different kinds of fish. We have a program here where we take groups into the Conasauga River and show them all the different fish living in their different habitats. The Forest Service is very proud of the clean water we have and that's what enables all these fish to exist in here. So what are some species we'll be seeing? Well, we're gonna see a freshwater drum. These are very large fish. Uh, some of them up to six, eight pounds, and they're in schools of up to 20 fish. So when wow. you get close to them, you're gonna, you're gonna be very impressed with uh, being that, that near to such large fish. And they don't get to take a break from school. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> we'll also uh, see, uh, when we get up into the riffle area, some of the darters, which are our most colorful species. They're very small, most of them about three to five inches, but numerous fish. And we also have one in here that's uh, a log perch, one of them is a uh, federally listed the Conasauga log perch, but the more common one is the mobile. And it's interesting because it flips rocks with its nose. Wow. So if we get to see that, that'll be pretty neat. Okay, try and remember some of the things that you saw so that we can talk about it when we get back. Let's go swimming. Right. Snorkeling is by far the best way to see species in their natural habitat. It's like being a fish in a huge aquarium. And no matter how many times I snorkel, there is always the excitement of a new discovery. This area of the Conasauga River is located in the Cherokee National Forest. The river is fed by several cold water springs coming from the Blue Ridge Mountains. So temperatures of the water, even in the summer, are cold enough to warrant a wetsuit, like we all have on. Time seems to drift away as we explore this area, and it's smaller than a football field. Yet the water is teeming with activity, and we'll get help from our guides to identify what we see. We're looking at the holiday darter. It's a very beautiful fish with lots of reds and greens on it. Uh, the population here is one of four left in the, in the world, and uh, it may be a totally unique species from the other three populations. Over the years, over 70 species of fish have been noted in this pristine area. Imagine many years ago Native Americans living here and appreciating the abundance of the river and surrounding areas. As with all of the world, the health of the environment is so very important. So there are devoted residents and organizations who work hand in hand with the Park Service to protect and preserve this national treasure. Hey guys, look at Canada. Let's go talk about what we saw. Yeah, definitely. Come on over. 
Hello. Hi. Hey. What'd you see? Fish. Lots of really? Fish. How many different kinds? Did you count? Oh, so many. I, I lost count. Yeah. At least 20, bro. We saw a huge, huge. A big one? Yeah. Could have been eight pounds? Mm -hmm. I think I saw that one, oh, too. Yeah. What was your favorite fish? Definitely the red horse. The hog sucker. I love the holiday darter. My favorite was the mobile log perch. That little guy flips rocks with his nose. He is the coolest fish <laughs> out here. Thank you so much and to everyone else for letting us come out here today. I think we all had a great time. Oh, hi. I'm so glad you're here. You know, it always excites me to meet young people who love to protect the earth as much as I do. Young people who are pioneering powerful ways to conserve and protect our planet for all of us. I call them Eco Defenders. Let's find out what they're up to. I think people have a vision of what Hawaii's like. You expect the beaches and you know, you see these beautiful mountains, but we are one of the most vulnerable places in the world for climate change. There's a very serious need to address it and look for solutions to start helping this place become more resilient and adapt to the changes that we're about to face. When I came to Hawaii, I had just kind of an assumption that this place would be really environmentally friendly. But when I um, walked around campus, I just started to notice a lot of plastic and styrofoam. Finding out that Hawaii is the highest per capita user of styrofoam was really shocking. Styrofoam is the type of plastic, it's made from petroleum because it's so lightweight. Over time, it breaks apart much, much faster than other types of trash. I connected with Surf Rider Foundation at UH Manoa. I was like, hey guys, let's do something on campus, something impactful, and let's just start a ban on styrofoam. We really wanted to tackle the use of single-use foam at our dining location. So we drafted a petition. We were able to table multiple times all over campus. We just want to give student feedback so we have like an accurate representation. And we were able to pass the policy in April of 2012. All food service locations cannot use foam for any of their products. Any new vendors must have that incorporated into their contracts and any existing vendors, when their contract is up for renewal, must go ahead and switch. Dore was really kind of singular in that she petitioned, she got in front of the students, she went to classes, she spoke to the you know, administration, the, the faculty. She really went the full course to make sure this thing passed. After UH passed their styrofoam ban, we wanted to tackle it on a larger scale. So we're currently working on an island-wide ban for the whole island of Oahu and the city and county of Honolulu to ban styrofoam. Sustainability has become kind of a buzzword and it's become something that people brush off a little bit. They don't see that this movement, it's really a, a culture we're trying to create and a collective understanding of the connection that we all have to our land and our water. Wasn't that amazing? Okay, now it's your turn. If you or someone you know is doing something remarkable to help our planet, let us know about it and you could be our next Eco Defender. I gotta go. Aqua Kids will be right back. Hey, Drew here. Be sure to join us next week as we continue our Tennessee Aquarium adventure with a behind the scenes look at baby sharks, jellies, and penguins. I'm Jalen, and this is Earth Edition. Rivers connect to land, lakes, bays, and seas. They circulate important things like nutrients and sediments, and support many species of fish, plants, and animals. Rivers provide us with food to eat, energy for electricity, and beautiful places to enjoy recreation. So protecting and restoring our rivers is very important. It's estimated that 10 to 20,000 freshwater species are gone or at risk, and 37% of the world's freshwater fish species are on the brink of extinction. The good news is that there are many wonderful programs in place for our rivers, and each of us can do our part to make a difference too. Find out how to help with your local waterway cleanup and help your family practice water conservation with easy tips around your home and yard. I'm Jalen, and this has been Earth Edition. Welcome back to Aqua Kids. 
Tennessee Aquarium, Conestoga River, Cherokee National Forest, sturgeon, trout, tons of fish here in the river. Tell me, what was your favorite part about today's experience? Well, it's amazing to know that people can use plain old city water to help raise freshwater fish. Yeah, and it's great that people are helping out reintroduce fish to their natural habitat. Wonderful project. And I was just so fascinated by the fact that the Conestoga River is one of the most biodiverse places in all of the world. Where else can you find a fish that has a nose that can flip rocks over to find food? It means incredibly fresh water. You guys did a great job today helping my friends out. Really appreciate it. Remember, it's up to you to keep it green and blue. Help protect our planet, and we'll see you next time on Aqua Kids. Bye. Bye. excited to be out here at the Conestoga River today with the Aqua Kids. Whether I'm at the Tennessee Aquarium or I'm out here in the field, I have a great time whenever I get the chance to tell today's young people about all the amazing things that live in our watery world around us. So whether we're up here high in the headwaters of the Conestoga River, whether we're downstream right next to the Tennessee Aquarium on Big River, or whether we're on the coasts next to the ocean, there's amazing animals that share this space with us. And I love working with groups like this where we get a chance to share those animals with others. 